Good morning. Good morning. You guys awake? Good to go? I got that coffee though. You'll be awake soon. I'll get you guys awake. Man, uh, welcome to Streamsong Church. Uh, if you're new here, we're just thankful to, to have you here and to participate in worship with us. We're in week six of uh, our Primary Colors series. This is a series called Primary Colors. Uh, man, the three primary colors are what? What are they? <laughs> Somebody here knows that. Red, yellow, blue. I had to look that up uh, when we first came up with this sermon series. Red, yellow, and blue are the three primary colors. And these are the colors that all of the other colors come from. Every other shade, every other color comes from these three primary colors. And that's like our core values. Our core values are the values that everything we do comes from in this church. Uh, they are our primary colors. And also, man, when we, when we make decisions, uh, we want to run the decisions through our core values. Are these things that we're thinking about doing consistent with what our core values are? And if they're not, then we're not probably not going to do them. Um, so we're in this sermon series called Primary Colors about our core values. Last week, uh, Charles preached on unity. He preached on unity, he did a great job with the sermon on unity, and today is our next core value that we want to share with you and just really lay the foundation for going forward is generosity. That's our next core value of generosity, man. I'm telling you, we wouldn't be here right now. We wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for God, first and foremost, if it wasn't for him working in and through all of us. But we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God working through others' generosity. Others' generosity, man. Before we even started meeting on Sunday mornings and early on in the process of, of, of how we've gotten to today, uh, 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 we, uh, what's common for church planting is raising money. You have to raise funds. It's fundraising uh, to start a church institutionally, um, which is where we're at. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the God working through the generosity of others. And man, I've never done anything like that before. I've never done fundraising. I've been on mission trips to Brazil and Haiti where I had to raise maybe a grand or two, you know, but man, for a church institutionally, I've never done that before. I'm like, God, I don't know what to do. Like, how, how do I raise like this kind of money? Like new church plants, they say they tend to raise anywhere from 75 to like, 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 like $750,000. That's a lot of money, depending on how you want to start your church. And I was like having this conversation with God. I was like, man, I don't think we need $750,000, but we need something to work with. And lo and behold, man, uh, God just kind of uh, worked through uh, relationships we have and uh, through the generosity of others uh, with friends and partners, people nationally and locally, we were able to raise $60,000, a little over $60,000, man. That's a lot of money. Now to a big church, $60,000 is pocket change. They might laugh at me. <laughs> but man, if we're coming in humility where we started with zero, and we raised $60,000, man, that's a lot of money, man. That's humbling, and I praise God for that. I praise God for that. One church, we have a church partnership, they gave us a $15,000 check, $15,000 check, uh, no strings attached. No strings attached. I could not believe that. So, we're thanking God for the generosity of people. And it's not just the, our outside partners in this fundraising, it's also the generosity of you in our weekly giving and offering uh, in Streamsong Church. We couldn't do what we do without God working through people's generosity and how they're, um, and how they're giving of their financial resources to this church. So I'm thankful for all that, thankful for you. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is generosity. We should desire to be a generous church. Every church should be a generous church, and all the individuals in a church should desire and work towards being generous people within the church. Generosity, it's a language. It's a language that, that cuts across all barriers. It's a language that everybody can speak. It doesn't matter your differences in the world. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or you're Indian. It does not matter who you are. Everybody speaks the language of generosity. Generosity can bring people together. It can create bridges between people. Uh, you don't have to like each other to, 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 to love a generous person. I mean, it just builds bridges. Nobody in the history of the world has ever gotten mad at somebody for being generous. Have they? I'm not aware of it. I'm not aware of anybody being mad at somebody for, for being generous to them. 
Generosity, it also makes a powerful statement to people, not about who I am, it's not about me, but about who God is, about who God is. And generosity shows people that we are living what we claim to believe. And it shows who we're following, which is Jesus, which is Jesus. Man, and I recognize, uh, it is for me, I recognize that giving and generosity is a sensitive subject. It's a sensitive subject, and I get that. But man, of all God's commands, of all of the fruit he desires for us to bear, generosity is arguably the greatest challenge to our thinking and to our natural instincts to give and to be generous. That's our, probably one of our greatest challenges But I'm telling you this right now. I know this from personal experience. From personal experience. Whatever our greatest tests are, whatever our greatest challenges are, that's where our greatest blessing lies. It's where our greatest blessing waits for us, is through our greatest challenges. Now for some people, generosity is not that big of a deal. Like it's easy to be generous for some people. And that may not be where their their greatest blessing is. Their tests, their, their greatest challenges might be something else. So their greatest blessings are going to be there. But man, if you struggle with generosity, if you struggle with giving, man, if that's a real challenge for you, then I'm telling you right now, through personal experience, that the greatest blessing is waiting for you through your greatest challenge. Man, so we're in the book of 2 Corinthians today. Open up your, your Bibles if you have them. Uh, the scriptures on the screen 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 through 15. And before we read it, I just want to explain a little bit of context behind this uh, text. The Corinthian church. We're in the Corinthian church uh, today. Uh, We're in the Corinthian church. It was a local body of Christians in the city of Corinth, which was in uh, present-day Greece. In present-day Greece, it was planted by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is the guy who planted all these churches. When you see these New Testament Bible books, Ephesians and Galatians and Philippians and Colossians, those are all cities. Those are all cities in the Roman Empire where Paul planted churches, just like we're doing right now. Paul planted this church in Corinth. It's the Corinthian church. And 2 Corinthians is one of two letters that Paul wrote to the church. And these two letters, they cover a wide variety of issues, of challenges, um, of of encouragements and exhortations uh, to these, these Christians, just like you and me. Paul wrote these two letters of those things uh, to this church. And and Paul encourages the Corinthian church here in this scripture to take a collection for the church in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. To take a collection for the church in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is the mother church. Like, we have a mother church, which is Riverside in Horsham, PA. That's our mother church. Paul is encouraging them to take a collection for the mother church in Jerusalem. The Corinthian church was planted out of the Jerusalem church. The Jerusalem church was struggling. The Jerusalem church is where the gospel originated. It started there and then it went out all across the Roman Empire. So the Corinthian church, they were blessed through the Jerusalem church. But the Jerusalem church now is struggling because persecution Persecution caused the church to scatter. Many people scattered all across the Roman Empire because of persecution. And because of that scattering, now the Jerusalem church is really weak. The Jerusalem church is weakened. And Paul is calling them, step up. Take a collection for the Jerusalem church. They need you. This is an opportunity for you now. You may not be able to go to Jerusalem and help, but you can give. They need resources to be able to continue to do uh, what they're doing. So in this letter, he takes two chapters, chapters eight and nine, to encourage them in generosity, uh, what it means and why and how do we do it. Man, I highly recommend on your own time uh, to read 2 Corinthians chapters eight and nine. Um, on your own time and reading these two chapters. And uh, we're gonna look at the ending 10 verses, the ending 10 verses of chapter nine. You see, generosity, it has a potency to affect all kinds of situations and people around us. Generosity is potent, it's powerful. Like I said, it's a language that cuts across all barriers. But Paul, he actually takes a different uh, direction here. Instead of uh, talking about how generosity impacts things and people around us, He actually, he makes it more personal to them. He makes it more personal to us by explaining to them how generosity impacts you. 
how it impacts you and your heart. That's the direction Paul is going here in this text. So let's read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verses 6 through 15, it says this. It says, the point is this. I love that. Whatever he just said before that, he's like, all right, guys, listen. The point is this. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, talking about God, that's from a psalm in the Old Testament. He has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. I want to share with you just three things from this text uh, for us to take home, these three things. And the first thing that I want to share with you here what the scripture is saying is generosity is returned to us. Generosity is returned to us, not just as a church. It's going to be returned to us as a church. We want to be a generous church institutionally. It's going to be returned to us as individuals, as individuals in the church. Paul uses the image of a, of a farmer sowing seed. The, the farmer's just uh, chucking out some seed. And what he's saying here, uh, we will reap whatever it is we sow. Whatever it is we sow, you sow three seeds, you're going to get three fruit. You sow three seeds, you're going to get three stalks. You sow 10 seeds, you're going to you're you're reap 10 stalks. If you sow 100 seeds, what happens with the farmer? He's going to reap 100 stalks. Whatever it is that we sow, we will reap. It will return to us. God gave you the seed, the scripture says. Everything that we have God has given to us in the first place, and he will supply and multiply your seed for growing. This isn't like a hunch. Paul, this isn't a guess, that, a guess that Paul is saying. He's saying it will happen. It will happen. This is a promise from God when we're generous. He will return it to us. He will return it to us, man. It's like a boomerang. You throw a boomerang out, and what happens? If you throw it the right way with a good flip of the wrist, the boomerang comes back to us. It comes back to us. And that's what happens when we are generous. When we are generous, God will return your generosity to you. And when we throw it out, it'll come back to us. Now, I don't know how, we don't know when, but God will return it to us. He will. He will. Even when it seems like he's not, like, man, like I'm, I'm being generous, but you got to check your motives. Like, are you giving? Are you generous because you want to get something back from God? Or are you giving and are you generous just because of who God is? Because of your love for him and what he has done for us on the cross. But if you're not seeing it return to you the way you want it to, maybe it's materially, but it's not always going to be material return. You know, if I, if I give a thousand bucks to somebody, he's not always just going to somehow just bring a thousand bucks back to me or more. That's not always how it works. God can do that. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen through generosity, but that's not always how it works. But we know through this scripture, God will always return it to us spiritually. Always. He will always return it to us spiritually. And the question is, is, is spiritual fruit Man, just as valuable and important or more than physical material fruit. Is it? Because sometimes spiritual fruit's not that big of a deal to us and we just want more money and we just want more material gain. God doesn't always return to us our generosity materially, 
but he always, always returns to us spiritually. And that's what he outlines here in this text. Man, my wife and I, my wife and I, uh, years ago, I guess probably like five years ago, when I first got, before I got into ministry, uh, we, were, we, were, we were going on two full-time jobs. We had two full-time jobs. I was making pretty good money. She was making really good money. We were tithing and giving. We were generous. And uh, we had it where we wanted it. And then I felt called to ministry. And you don't go into ministry to make money. So we, we, we went down from a, uh, two full-time jobs to uh, one full-time job and one part-time job. Okay? But we kept our, our giving. We kept our giving as it was. And then maybe I guess a couple years later, what happened was uh, we had kids and she wanted to go part-time. So that's, you know, we did that. So we went from one full-time job and one part-time job to two part-time jobs. So we're currently living off of two part-time jobs. And we haven't changed our giving. We haven't changed our giving since our two full-time jobs. I think we've kept it pretty close to what it was. But man, God has returned it to us. He hasn't made us richer financially. That's not the case. That's okay. He hasn't made us richer. He has provided for us. He has provided for us for our needs. He's even put us, uh, given us opportunities to make a little bit of more income here, some blessings here on the side to make more income. We did not budge on our generosity and on our giving, man. And I'm not bragging at all, guys. This is who we serve. This is God who we serve. He will return it to us, sometimes materially, but always spiritually. We would not be here, my wife and I, today, right now, uh, if we were not generous, if we we weren't submitted to God. I would not be here on this pulpit, man, if we weren't generous, radically generous with our resources that God has given us. But more importantly, like I said, he always returns it to us spiritually. And Paul shows us in this scripture what this looks like here in verses 10 and 11. What does it say? Generosity increases the harvest of our righteousness. It increases the harvest of our righteousness. And then in verse 11, it says it enriches us. It enriches us. Man, generosity, it facilitates God's sanctification in us. God grows us through our generosity. As we give sacrificially, he grows us. Man, when we distribute a seed, we harvest a spiritual fruit. Man, when we distribute a hundred seeds, we harvest a hundred spiritual fruits. Man, God grows us. That word righteousness, what does that mean? The harvest of our righteousness. Well, the, the harvest word, another word for that could be used would be fruits. The fruits of our righteousness. Uh, That's what the harvest means, our righteousness. Righteousness means our justifiedness. It's our right standing with God. That's our righteousness. And so it's the fruits of his justify, our justifiedness through God. It's God's acceptance of us. It's his acceptance of us. It's his, his acceptance of us through Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross. And what are these, these, the harvest of our righteousness, what are these fruits? These fruits, man, it could be a lot of things. Uh, you look at Galatians, it could be the, the, the fruits of the Spirit, um, uh, love and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and goodness and self-control. Man, we harvest fruit through our generosity, the fruits of our righteousness. It could be boldness. It could be boldness. It could be greater faith. It could be greater faith. Generosity increases the harvest of our righteousness. Man, think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. Guys, to enrich, he uses this term, uh, to enrich. Man, and to enrich means to make wealthy. It means to make wealthy and not, not materially, really. It just means to, to have a wealth of heart, to have a wealth of mind, to, to have a, a wealth of disposition in your life, of vitality. It's this, this, this enrichment that comes from our generosity, It also means to improve or enhance the quality or value of. So in this context of what he's saying, generosity makes us spiritually and emotionally rich. When we're giving and we're not always just, we're not like a vacuum and we're just taking and collecting. And when we give sacrificially, when we're generous with what God has given us, 
man, we become, we grow, harvest of our righteousness, and we are enriched through our generosity. Man, Jesus said, what did he say? He said, it is more blessed. He said this. He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. The giver is happier than the getter. The giver is happier than the getter. And guys, that goes against all of our intuitions, does it not? It goes against all of our instincts that we're trained up in the world from day one. Man, we're, called, we're, we're, we're trained by the world to consume and to get and to build and to collect and to take. God wants us to, to give, to give sacrificially. That's what God wants us to do. And it goes against everything that we learn uh, in the world. But when has following Jesus ever not done that? When has following Jesus ever not challenged us and caused us to go against these instincts that we learn from the world? God wants us to be generous with everything that he has given to us. Now, what's the third thing? So we've seen generosity is returned to us. And we've seen here generosity increases the, the harvest of our righteousness and it, it enriches us. What do we see here, how it, impa- in, how it impacts us? Man, it produces, this is the most important one. It produces thanksgiving to God. It produces glory to God. It produces glory to God. Man, when we give, God is glorified. God is glorified and he's thanked. That's what the scripture says, right? It says he is glorified and he is thanked. Man, when somebody gives maybe some money to somebody, uh, what, what, what hopefully happens? What hopefully happens? Man, if I, if I give Charles a dollar, he's gonna what? Thank God. Man, he's gonna be like, man, thank you, but thank God. Thank God for this generosity. So this transaction, it's not just a transaction between me and Chuck. It's a transaction really between us and God. Where when I give to Charles, he thanks God. I give to Charles an up. He thanks God. That's what happens when we give. That's the transaction that is really happening. Man, thanksgiving to God, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Man, have you ever been given a generous gift and you thank God for it? Has that happened? Yeah. Man, you thanked God for, man, this person didn't have to do this. He was being generous. And it may not have been money. Maybe, you know, it, it, it was meals. Meals for, uh, you know, we were pregnant and people, they brought meals to our house in that way. Man, we just thank God for that. We thank God for that. Thanking, thanksgiving to God is a big deal. It is a big moment when we thank God. We give glory to God through generosity. Man, generosity, it's less a transaction that benefits you. There are benefits. There are benefits. It impacts us as we can see. But man, this is really about a transaction that shoots up glory to God. And that's really what it's all about. Man, how? How? Generosity, as we can see in this text, it's not like an intellectual issue, generosity. It's not an intellectual issue or a matter of personal will, That's not what it is. It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. The scripture says there, it says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. In his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Giving exhibits God's heart. So how do we get to this decision to give cheerfully? Not just to give, but to give cheerfully to be happy, to want to, to to give cheerfully. How do we get to that with pure motives apart from self-gain? Remember, I shouldn't be giving just so I can get something back. I should just be giving because it's what God calls me to do. I should be generous. But how do we get to that point where we can do that cheerfully and not expect anything back? And not expect anything back? Guys, because of sin, our flesh wants to take, we talked about, it wants to collect, it wants to consume, and keep, but God wants us to give and distribute and produce cheerfully. God wants us to be channels of blessing. He wants us to be channels of blessing, not reservoirs. Not reservoirs of blessing. God is blessing us with these resources and everything he gives us. And are we, are we reservoirs where we're just collecting it, or are we channels of blessing where we're taking what God has given us and we're distributing it out 
cheerfully to others. Is that what it looks like? Man, giving and generosity may be the easiest thing to be legalistic about. I'm telling you right now, I've experienced it. It may be the easiest thing to be legalistic about. We either think that if I don't give enough, God will be mad at me. Do we not? We think God will be mad at me if I don't give enough. If I give anything, or if I give too much, then God won't provide for me. We don't trust him. We think that he won't provide uh, for me. In both of these thoughts, we're not starting from the right place. We're not starting from the right place. Instead of starting with I, I, we need to start with he. We need to start with he. Guys, in the previous chapter of Paul's thesis on generosity in chapter 8, he directly, he directly ties the gospel to generosity. And the scripture is on the screen. It's 2 Corinthians 8 through 9. This is what it says. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, this is about he, not I, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. It's about he, not I. It's about him and what he has done. And what Paul is saying there is he's, he's outlining the cross. He's outlining the cross right there. Jesus was generous with us beyond measure. He left the riches of heaven. Jesus had every conceivable resource possible in all of creation available to him in heaven, and he left it. He left it. He left it. He impoverished himself to come to earth and to live with us and he left the riches of heaven to become poor. But he did it for our sake so we could become rich in heaven. So we could become rich in heaven. He did that. At the cross, you see, we die to our sin. We die to our sin and our, our old self is buried and we are resurrected into new life and we are freed from the power of sin and of that selfishness of, of not being generous. And by faith alone in Christ, we are as accepted as we ever will be by God. Through faith alone in Christ, we will be as accepted as we ever will be by God. We don't have to worry about, being mad, about God being mad if we don't give because his wrath was sent out on Jesus. He's not going to be mad. God's not mad if you don't give. He's not mad. His wrath went out on Jesus for all time. He's not going to be mad if you don't give. See, it's, 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 a, it's, an, it's an understanding that we lack of the gospel when we think that God is going to be mad at me if I don't give or if I don't give enough. We're not understanding the gospel. And we don't have to worry that he won't provide for us if we give. Or maybe we think we're giving too much. And we think God won't provide for us, but the cross says something different. It says that he will provide for you. If he can provide for our greatest need of salvation on the cross, then we can trust him that he will provide for our smaller needs in our life. That's what the cross says. We don't have anything to worry about. God's commands are never a detriment to us. God's commands always benefit us. They are never a detriment to us. The cross shows us that if he can, we can trust him to provide for my greatest need of salvation, then we can trust him for our smaller needs in our life. Man, how, I want to like practically apply this. Like, how does this look in our life on a practical situation? Man, I want to share with you how this practically looks in our lives. Now, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, God's law to his people for giving back to him was 10%. 10% of their income, that was the law. They had to do it. They were under God's law, and that was the law. It was 10% of their income. In the New Testament, there is actually no specific prescription for giving. There's no specific prescription for giving. Jesus gave the ultimate tithe of his life for us on the cross. He gave the ultimate tithe. We can never outgive God. God outgave us in every way on the cross. And there's no specific prescription for our generosity and for our giving because Jesus gave the ultimate tithe of his life for us. We're no longer required by God's law to give 10% of our income. We're no longer required by that. Now, what I mean by that, be careful, is this. What I mean is we're not required by law 
to give 10% of our income as, 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 a, as a measurement of our salvation. We're not required to give 10%. That, that, that's not how we meet the criteria now. It's faith and faith alone in Christ and what he did on the cross. Now the law just doesn't disappear and go away. It's still there, but it's no longer the criteria for our salvation. That's what that means. That's what that means. 10% to the Lord's work. Uh, we, we want to try to do that because we're under grace now. We're under grace now. We're no longer under the law. We are under grace now, 10%, it's a healthy benchmark to aim for. Man, of everything that God has given me, of everything that he has given me, I get 90% of it. That's a pretty sweet deal. That's still a sweet deal that I get 90% of what he's given me. 10%, it's just a healthy benchmark to aim for and work towards. And I'm gonna say this, to exceed. To exceed. And here's why, what we see in scripture just as Jesus succeeded what the Old Testament law required, he exceeded what the Old Testament law required by giving his life on the cross. We should seek to exceed what the Old Testament law required because of what Jesus did on the cross. So 10% is merely a benchmark. Man, we should exceed that and we should try to exceed it joyfully. That's what it looks like practically in our lives. Generosity for all of us is going to be a matter of biblical stewardship. I want you to remember that word, stewardship. Being a steward, a biblical steward of the resources that God has given us. Recognizing what Jesus has done for us. What stewardship means is, is recognizing that we don't own anything we have. Everything we have, Jesus owns. These chairs, literally everything. In Colossians, everything was made through him and for him and by him. These chairs, this stage, this shirt, man, from Old Navy, Everything, your necklaces, everything that we have literally is from God. Everything that we enjoy is from God. Our money, our cars, our house, our finances, everything is from God. That's, that's, how, that's, that's what stewardship is called. It's all a gift. And I am called to steward it. I'm not an owner. I'm not an owner, I'm a steward. I'm called to steward what God has given me and to steward it wisely for him while he gives it to me. It's in my care. His money, everything that he's given me is in my care. And he's done that out of his generosity. It's in my care. So what this looks like practically is, man, I know from experience, instead of first figuring out how much of my income I wanna spend on myself, and then God gets what is left over, that's ownership. Stewardship is first figuring out and determining what can I give to God? How much can I give? Okay, I've got, you know, $80,000 or $100,000, okay? This is my income. What can I first determine that God can get? And then everything that's left over, I get. That's biblical stewardship is first starting with God. That's biblical stewardship. But we often, the way we often approach it is God gets really what is left over. We don't start with him. We don't start with him. So we need to ask these questions, these questions when it comes to the, the resources that God's given us. A, in trying to figure out how much I should give to God, how much is sacrificial for me? What's the point where I feel like this is a sacrifice? Well, you're probably onto something. That may be the number for you. Is it a sacrifice? B, is it a sacrifice that reflects what Jesus has done for me? That's another piece of criteria. And then C, another criteria is with the cross in mind, can I do it cheerfully? I have determined this number to be what I want to give back to God. Can I do it cheerfully? If you can't do it cheerfully, then don't do it. Don't do it. That's what God's saying. Don't do it. Maybe you, maybe you give less, but you can do it cheerfully. I mean, whatever you do, you want to be able to do it cheerfully and to, be, and to do it happily for God. He doesn't want you to give with reluctance or compulsion or because you are forced. Guys, to give to the Lord's work, it almost always requires us to sacrifice things that I want but don't really need. You know, my wife and I, like, we don't have cable. Now, some of that is because, you know, we, we don't want the kids just watching so much garbage on TV. But some of that, too, is cable's expensive, you know, so we make that sacrifice. 
We want to be able to put ourselves in a position to give as much as we can to the Lord's work. So we sacrifice cable to maybe get an extra hundred bucks, right? It always requires us to make sacrifices of things that we probably don't really need, that we probably don't really need. The problem is, is we often act as if giving to God is like a bill. Do we not? Like we have our water bill and we have our electrical bill and we have our mortgage and we have our property tax bill. I could go on and on. There's so many bills since we started owning a house. And we treat giving back to God like it's a bill. Like it's just another bill that we have, just like the electrical bill. Man, that's not what giving back to God is. It's not just another bill. It, it is the thing. It is the thing in our walk with Christ. It's not just another bill. And, that is, and it's where we start in our lives, in our walk with Christ when it comes to generosity. Now the ancient Greek word for cheerful in this text for cheerful in this text is hilaros. It's hilaros. It's the root of our English word for what? I'm sure you can figure it out. Hilarious. Great job. <laughs> hilarious. Now, in today's context, in the world today, when we think of the word hilarious, like it's just like, you know, we're laughing to a funny joke. That's not what it was back then, man. That's not what it was back then. Hilarious was just happy. Hilarious was just happy. And that's what he's trying to say here in this, in this word uh, for hilarious, for cheerful. Man, at the thought of giving, do you have that feeling of hilarity? Think about how you laugh really hard at a joke. <laughs> right? Do you do that when you're giving? When you're giving to God, are you so cheerful? Are you so happy that you're just like delirious? Like it's just hilarious. Like I'm so happy. I know it's convicting, isn't it? I'm not there. I feel like we give cheerfully, but man, this, this level of, of happiness that we get from giving to God, this hilarity, man, that's what we want to strive for. That's what we want God to work on our hearts to get to. It's just this happy, hilarious, cheerful giving to him. And everything that he's given us, it all starts with him. It doesn't start with I. I can't do this. I need all of these things. It starts with he and what he has done on the cross. And those electrical bills and those water bills and the property tax bills, they're forced to, we're forced to pay them. We have to do it. It stinks, I know. We have to pay those bills, man. But giving to the Lord's work, we don't have to. We don't have to. We don't. We're not required to under law. But man, we should. He wants us to. Because he has blessing ahead of us. The harvest of our righteousness. And he wants to enrich us. But most importantly, he wants us to give glory back to him. And he wants us to thank him.